G'day folks. A lot of people make videos about how they've modified their four-wheel drive and what equipment they've used. Well, this video is slightly different. Behind me is a 2015 FJ Cruiser. I bought it brand new and in 2017, I started modifying it. I fitted everything that you see on the vehicle behind me, bull bar, winch, bash plates, rooftop tent, etc. So I've been living with these for the past five or six years. And this video is all about how these modifications have stood the test of time. Did they work? Did they not work? Would I make the same choices again today? So let's get stuck into the video. So I'm not sponsored by any one of the manufacturers that I mentioned. I'm not sponsored by anyone. Uh, I'm only highlighting the products that I've used on the vehicle and how they have performed over the years that I've had them on. Most of them have been on the vehicle for five to seven years. All right, so one of the first things I fitted was this ARB Deluxe Bull Bar. Now, I think this is one of the best looking bull bars for the FJ Cruiser. It looks really fantastic. It's, um, it's a solid steel bull bar. Now, the good thing about a steel bull bar is you can mount all of your accessories on there, winch, spotlights, fog lights, antennas, you name it. You can mount it on a steel bull bar and it will give you really good protection from impacts. And I've had several uh, impacts. I've I'd had a couple of unfortunate incidents where I've hit an animal and also some trees. So, I mean, call me careless, uh, but the bull bar is still in one piece. It's got a bunch of scuff marks, but there's no dents in the bull bar. It's really solid. And most importantly, the car is still protected perfectly well, no dents, no damage to the car at all. So the other thing that you need to know about bull bars is what is your aim? Are you trying to protect the car from damage or are you trying to protect the occupants from damage? So a steel bull bar will protect the car from damage, but a lot of the impact of the force of the hit will be transferred through to the chassis of the car and then through to the driver behind the wheel. Now, if you have airbags, you've got more protection there, but if you're driving an older car without airbags, then the, your, the driver's gonna get the force of the impact. If you have an aluminium bull bar or a plastic bull bar, they are going to absorb some of that impact and transfer less of that force to the chassis and to the car. So you will be, as a passenger, perhaps safer, but your car will sustain more damage. So would I make the same choice again today? I have a choice of steel, aluminium or plastic bull bars. Now, obviously the heaviest of those three is the full steel bull bar, like the one behind me. An aluminium bull bar is half steel, half aluminium. You can still mount spotlights and winches on them, but they will give you less protection. A plastic bull bar, on the other hand, you can't mount heavy things like winches on there. And that is designed to completely absorb the impact. So it will bend and buckle and crush and absorb the impact. And therefore it'll transfer less of the force through to the cabin and give you more protection, but at the cost of damaging your car more. So the question is, do I want to protect me or do I want to protect the car? Or am I worried about protecting whatever it is that I hit? So ambulances tend to have plastic bull bars because they often operate in urban environments when there's a lot of uh, pedestrians around. If they hit somebody, then the pedestrian will be more protected. In my case, I think a steel or anim aluminium bull bar is the best choice. <sighs> Which one would I choose? Aluminium gives, it's a, it's a lot lighter. So that's got that going for it. But I, I really want to protect my car from damage. So I think that I would probably still go with a steel bull bar next time around, just for peace of mind. Right, let's talk about the bash plates. Now, I've had my bash plates fitted at the same time as the bull bar and the winch, and they're basically four millimeter steel plates that go underneath the front of the winch, uh, underneath the front of the bull bar, and all the way underneath the bottom of the car. They are solid steel and they are worth their weight in gold. They protect the car underneath 
from uh, hits. Many, many times I've hit rocks underneath the car and the bash plates have actually bent and they then started vibrating against the exhaust or something underneath and all I did was undid the bolts, added some washers underneath and tightened the bolts again and that brought the bash plates a little bit further away from the chassis and the vibration stopped and they're good to go again. So bash plates are an absolutely vital bit of kit that I would not hesitate to put on again. Uh, my bash plates are by ARB simply because they uh, fit to the bull bar uh, perfectly. But any bash plates that are four millimeter steel plate will do. And yeah, I can't speak highly enough of them. They are worth their weight in gold. So yes, I would definitely fit bash plates in the future. Right, let's talk about suspension. Now, when I had the Old Man EMU BP51 shocks fitted, I also had a two inch lift done. Now the springs are also by Old Man EMU and they are designed to work with the shocks. Now, if you get a, your springs changed for heavier duty springs, then it is very, very important to make sure that the shocks and the springs are designed to work with each other. You don't want really, really firm springs because then your shocks aren't working and that defeats the purpose of having shocks and you don't want springs that compress too much because then your shocks are working too much and potentially your car is hitting the bump stops and you don't want that either. Occasionally it's fine, but all the time you don't want that either. So you really need to have a matching set of shocks and springs and then you will get the best performance out of your shocks. The two inch lift, it's uh, raised the car a bit, but when I put the, all this weight on the car, the bull bar, the bash plates, the roof tent, all the stuff inside the car, the, the shocks do settle a little bit, the springs, sorry, do settle a little bit. And it's still higher than factory, but it's, it's settled down to a nice level where I'm still sitting up higher when I'm driving. And uh, the bodies are a little bit raised higher, so it's, it's nice. You can see how much distance there is between the tyre and the top here, so that is a bigger distance. And I'm very, very happy with the, with the shocks, oh, so with the suspension. Oh, actually, I'm happy with both the shocks and suspension because they work together to give you a nice, comfortable ride. And it's, as I said, it's worthwhile making sure that your shocks and your suspension are matched together to give you the best performance. The shocks themselves, they've got an external reservoir and they have two controls. You can set the compression and the rebound. So the compression is how quickly does the shock compress when you go over a bump and the rebound is how quickly does it go back to its original setting. And when I had them fitted, I basically asked ARB to set, set it for the maximum weight for the vehicle, knowing full well that I'm going to have the rooftop tent and the whole fit out so they have I haven't needed to modify them in at all in the six years or so since I've had them and they've performed absolutely fantastically now I've it's, it's hard to compare one shock to another but I've been on enough trips with enough people in different vehicles different sets of shocks and by driving over the same terrain and when they were talking about how incredibly rough and difficult it was and how uh, harsh the corrugations were, I was driving along going, yeah, they're, they're not that bad. They, yeah, you can feel the corrugations, but they're certainly nowhere near as bad as they happen to be experiencing. So I, the, the, the car feels pliant when it's going over rough ground and it's not bouncing all over the place, so it's set up correctly. And I am super, super happy with it. The only negative thing I can say about the shocks is the on, only on the passenger side, the front passenger side shock, it developed a squeak. And this was after it being on the car for about five years, it started suddenly squeaking. I took it back to ARB and they identified the, the fault was the bottom part of the shock, there's a spherical joint. So it's this where that bolt goes through. Yep. Okay. There's a rose joint in there. Yep. And what it what happened like mud shit like gets stuck in them and they all the grease gets washed out. Oh okay. And they squeak. So if you can you can hold the shock mm -hmm. while I bounce it, you can actually feel. Oh, yeah. If you hold the shock like you can feel yeah. it. Okay. But you can feel the noise through there. Yes, you're right. You know what I mean? Okay, okay, yeah. It was actually a very, very cheap fix. 
because these are high-end shocks you can actually remove that and replace that part with some of the cheaper shocks you have to replace the entire shock because it's all in one but with the BP51s you can replace various components of the shock and so they replaced that part and that lasted about another year and it started squeaking again I was recently back to ARB and they very kindly replaced not just the passenger side but the driver side as well both top and bottom the spherical joints on the both the shocks on both sides so hopefully that's the end of my trouble with the shocks uh, it seems to have been a manufacturing fault well that's what they told me the first time around the second time around the guy basically said oh it's a shock that needs maintenance you need to blast it with a pressure hose and then spray it with lithium grease and that'll keep it going okay if you can believe that well maybe it's true but I haven't done anything to the other three shocks in the six plus years that I've had them and they've been perfectly fine so I don't know why the front left hand shock started to squeak but ARB have very kindly replaced it and it's perfectly fine so would I buy BP51 shocks again? well you know when it's working it is absolutely fantastic and for that reason alone I think I probably would so while I'm still at the front of the car, the other thing that I've had replaced is the upper and lower control arms on the suspension. Now, this is something that you probably should change if you're lifting your car, because as soon as you lift the car, the control arm is now at a different angle. It's changed the geometry of the suspension and it's not performing as optimally as a control arm that's designed for the, for the two inch lift. So I've had the top, uh, top and bottom control arms replaced for heavy duty control arms and so far they are performing fantastically well, I've got no complaints with them at all. The ground is really really loose, I've got the traction control on, I've got the diff locks on and I'm gripping the steering wheel holding on for dear life. Many people don't reinflate their tyres after coming off the soft sand tracks simply because it's too much of a hassle. My tyre pressures are set to about 20 psi which seems to be a good balance between firm and soft tracks. So for the tyres I've gone with BF Goodrich All-Terrain TAKO2. Now the size of the tyres on here are 265 70, 17, and this is my second set. Now out with the first set of BFGs I did about 120,000 kilometres and I replaced them a little bit earlier than I should have but I was just about to go on a big trip and I thought it's best to put new tyres on there and in hindsight it was a good choice to do but the second time around I was tossing up between fitting the all-terrain KO2s or the Mud Terrain KM3s which is just at the time we just released and now as luck would have it I couldn't get those so I stuck with the all-terrain KO2s and they're a fantastic tyre. Now I've been in so many different terrains all around the country, uh, corrugated gravel roads, dirt tracks, some really really soft sand, mud, clay, grass, you name it and of course on sealed road. Now they, these as the name would suggest all-terrain tyres they've performed fantastically in all of those conditions uh, they perform really well both in the wet and the dry uh, the only place where these tyres don't perform optimally is in really really super soft clay we've had a massive downpour and it's turned the familiar red dirt into a slippery mess as much as I love all-terrain tyres, this is one environment where they do not excel. You can see just how slippery the red clay is. 
Well, they coat the wheels and they fill up the treads, causing the entire car to just skate down the hill. There's very, very little control. I'm basically sliding down the hill. The clay tends to get into the treads and clog them up and then you've got a whole flat, smooth tyre and it just skids. Uh, mud terrains would probably be better suited to that application. But considering the type of travel I do, mostly it's touring, mostly it's not terribly challenging tracks. And so the all terrains suit my style of travel perfectly. I'm super happy with the BFGs. Uh, the, on these set I've done probably I'm looking at about 60,000 k so far and they're wearing really nicely. I can't see any uh, scratches or chips in the tread so it's wearing really nicely. They're pretty quiet on the road as well. Now would I change these tyres to a different brand? Well I'm basically I like sticking with things that I know work for me and unless there's a very very compelling reason to change I'm likely to stick with BFGs in the future as well uh, if I were to have a different brand I'd probably be just as likely to say I'm going to stick with that particular brand but my experience with BFGs has been positive they've been fantastic so I'm probably going to stick with these right let's talk about the winch this is a worn Evo winch with a synthetic rope and this Bluetooth remote. Now this is my second winch. My first winch was also a worn Evo winch. Now I had my first winch installed about 2017 and for about four years I had no reason to use it. I just didn't go into places where I would need a winch. Whenever I got stuck, Max Tracks were perfectly fine for me. So if I would have made this video about a year ago, I would have said, do you really need a winch? For me, no. It depends on what kind of travel you do, but for me, it wasn't necessary. But a year ago, I went to the Vic High Country where it was really mountainous terrain and I got stuck and my winch wasn't working and I really would have needed a winch to get unstuck. My plan is to try and keep at least two wheels on the grass. I've got diff locks on and I'm hoping to be able to at least maintain some sort of traction. But it's just far too slippery. No. Just making my situation worse. Okay, one last attempt. No luck. Well, the only thing left now is to get my car into a better position so that we can winch. So I need to get the nose of my car closer to that fallen tree. What's that tree by a big tree? Luckily somebody came along who did have a winch and they helped me out. But as soon as I got back I had that winch replaced and now I have a working winch. And now if somebody asks me is a winch necessary, well my first question would be what type of travel are you planning to do? If it's all outback tracks and desert where there's not a tree in sight, well a winch is not of, of great use. But if you're just doing general four-wheel driving or you're an adventurous uh, traveler like I am and you just want to go anywhere I would say yes a winch is absolutely necessary because you never know when you're going to need it or when you're going to need to extract somebody else so um, a winch is absolutely necessary. Would I buy a worn winch again? This one works well I have no issues with it uh, this is a nine and a half thousand pound winch as was my first one I think this is the biggest one that can fit in this bull bar and uh, I have no complaints against about it. It works really, really well. Bluetooth remote. You can also plug in an external controller somewhere um, into, into here. And uh, yeah, I've got no issues with the winch. Uh, so definitely, definitely I would get this winch again. 
Right, let's talk about spotlights. These are ARB Intensity LED spotlights. I had them fitted at the same time as the Bull Bar, Bash Plate and Winch. And it was basically a case of, I've got a bit of money left over from all the modifications. What's the best thing I can find in the store for spotlights? And this is what I chose. They work. Now, <laughs> would I choose the same thing again today? Um, probably not. Now, there's nothing wrong with these spotlights. They do the job just fine, but there are better products on the market. Now, the problem I have with these spotlights is if you're driving along a dark track at night, you turn the spotlights on, everything is super, super, super bright for about 20 to 30 meters in front of the car, and then it is completely pitch black. It really is quite difficult to navigate. I can only see about 10, 15 meters in front of me. The only way I can tell what's going on is by glancing up at my off-road map, running back at the road. Because otherwise, I don't know if there's a corner coming up. I have to have a quick glance and then back at the road. Uh, one of the lights is set up for distance and the other one is set up for spread and I think that's the fairly common for spotlights, but uh, They're just super bright and then it's pitch black and I don't like that in, in, in order to fix that I Turn on the LED light bar that I've got on top of the car now that is just an, a, a really really cheap LED light bar from a cheap uh, car parts store I won't tell you the name you can probably guess the name if you're in Australia but that's a very very cheap light bar it's a super cheap light bar and uh, it works really well because that gives me the range and it fills out the darkness that I'm looking for so would I choose these spotlights again today probably not there's a product that I'm looking at by a company called Laser, L-A-Z-E-R. They're a British company and they make a set of spotlights called the Sentinel. There's a nine inch and a 12 inch version. Now I'm looking at the Laser Sentinel 12 inch and they've got some new technology built into the lights where it does the roll of the spotlight and the LED light bar. So it does both distance and spread in both lights and it is not such a harsh white light. It is a much nicer, mellower light and I'm really interested in trying those out. So I think if I were to swap these, I would probably choose the Laser Sentinel spotlights instead. And then perhaps I can do away with the uh, roof mounted LED light bar and save some weight up top. So the Safari Snorkel, also known as a raised air intake. It's been on the car for eight years. It's been bruised and battered by branches and it is still holding up really well. The plastic is still in one piece. It's rock solid and it's done its job. It cleans the air, it no, doesn't clean the air. It draws in cleaner air from up here rather than down low. So it's definitely done its job. The air filter, every time I go to check it, it is a lot cleaner than it otherwise would be if I didn't have the snorkel. And of course it lets me go in a lot deeper water. You ready mate? Ready. As soon as he starts moving, I need to go. There's no turning back. That current is super strong. Just look how much his vehicle was pushed to the right. Oh boy, here we go. I would not build a car without fitting a, a snorkel and I would choose Safari because it it's, does a fantastic job and it's lasted the distance. So let's talk about the rooftop tent and awning. These are both made by Alucab. The rooftop tent is a, an Alucab Gen 3.1 rooftop tent and the awning is the 270 Shadow Awn once again by Alucab. Let's open them up and then I'll talk about what my experience with this product is like. Okay, so 
As you can see, it takes no time at all to erect the tent and the awning. The awning is fantastic, it doesn't need poles, it is super strong, it's very robust, especially in strong winds. The tent, this is the, well, basically the first generation of the Gen 3.1 tents. Over time, the Gen 3.1 tent has gone from having single canvas to double canvas, to having air vents in the top and all sorts of extra uh, innovations. This is the very first, one of the first ones in Australia. I've had it for five years or so, since 2017. And I've used this tent easily, easily 200 times or more. And uh, how has it fared? Well, the tent is still in one piece. It's, uh, it's received quite a lot of wax from overhead branches. Um, but being an aluminium shell, it's pretty strong. You can see a couple of little dents close up, but it's still a pretty strong tent. It's holding its shape. Uh, the rubber seal around the edge of the tent is still in shape. It hasn't lost its integrity. It still doesn't let dust or water into the tent. So it's held up remarkably well. The awning has had some issues. Uh, essentially, the awning itself is a fine product, I can't really fault it, but when the awning was installed, one of the bolts that holds the awning to the tent started rubbing through the canvas of the awning and then the arm, the aluminium arm of the awning, it started rubbing through two layers of canvas and the metal arm. That bolt was replaced with a round-headed bolt and since then it's been okay. The awning is, is really tough, uh, I've had it up in really strong winds, no poles, it just works and I can open it up and pack it away with one hand in 30 seconds flat, same thing with the tent, uh, they are both really great products. Some more good features of the Alucab tent is the fact that it can turn the FJ from a regular weekend four-wheel driver machine into a touring rig. simply because you bolt the uh, tent onto some load bars on the roof and then you can bolt other things onto the tent. The Alucab awning is designed to be bolted directly to the tent itself. I've got some max tracks on the roof and some solar panels. I've got a quick pitch uh, shower ensuite on the other side of the tent and they all bolt to the tent. So if I want to remove everything that's on the roof, I'll just loosen six bolts and the whole thing lifts off. So for that it is a very very fantastic solution. The FJ is already short on space in the back and the fact that I can get all my bedding out of the car into the tent means that I've got more space in the car for other things like camera gear. So, uh, would I make the same choice again today? That is an interesting question because when I first chose the Cap tent, there weren't very many options on the market. There was the traditional uh, sort of flip open type rooftop tent and there was a, a clamshell tent made by James Baroud, which is basically a plastic pop-up uh, rooftop tent. And I was basically tossing up between the James Baroud tent and the Alucab tent. And the James Baroud tent was a lot lighter. The Alucab 
heavier but more robust and heavy duty. In the end I think I made the right decision between those two tents. The James Baroud one was rather flimsy and he certainly could not bolt an awning and an ensuite and all the other things I have onto the tent itself. So I'm much better off having gone for the Alucap tent and the Alucap tent has certainly lasted five years and it looks like it's going to last at least another five more. Uh, the canvas on the tent, perfectly fine. The mesh, perfectly fine. Uh, the one downside, actually there's a few downsides of the tent. Let's talk about that. Now, these downsides, some of them are subjective. The mattress that you get with the Alucab tent. Mattress is too glorified a word. It's a concrete slab. It is even grey in colour. It's like lying on concrete. Now, some people like that. I prefer a little bit more of a comfort uh, in my bed. So I've actually changed the mattress now. I've got a, a memory foam mattress in there and it is really comfortable. Uh, I've just been up to Cape York for three weeks, slept in the tent for three weeks straight. Perfectly fine, it is really good. But the fact that you can take out the mattress, replace it with something that you, you like better is just a bonus for the tent. And it's also lighter than the concrete slab that they give you. So, to me, the concrete slab is a downside. Uh, for others, they might like it. Some of the other downsides, well, everything that you see on top of the load bars, so the tent, the awning, the max tracks, the um, ensuite, it's all adding weight to the roof of the car. Now, even though the uh, load bars and roof rack are designed to take the amount of weight, the roof is generally not designed to take that much weight. You know, in, your, in your typical car, the roof is designed to take 80 kilos, 100 kilos. A lot of the times they don't even publish these the specifications. So it's hard to determine exactly what your roof, roof load is. Having said that, the car is fine, the roof rack is fine, the uh, tent and awning are perfectly fine. So after five plus years of grueling uh, off-road tracks, corrugations galore, everything is still in one piece and it's going to be fine for a long time. So as much as I don't like all that weight up on the roof, it allows me to turn my FJ into the touring machine that I want. So would I choose the same tent in the future? If I had to go by a rooftop tent today, I would certainly look around some more and see what else I can find that can give me the same thing as the Alucab has. So if you've got a, uh, a different four-wheel drive, if you have a, a canopy, uh, then I highly recommend getting an Alucab tent because they, uh, they will last forever. Uh, and if something does go wrong with the Alucab tents, you can just take the canvas off and put new canvas on. With the awning, you can pull the canvas out, put new canvas in. You can replace arms, you can get a mallet and bash the uh, tent back into shape. So for that alone, it's better than a plastic tent. It's repairable, it's replaceable. So it's kind of worth it. But the question still remains, would I get an AUCAB tent today? I can't answer that actually because I'd have to go have a look at every other product that's out there, see how they compare, see what the reviews are. I would love to go with something lighter, but generally rooftop tents are around about the same weight. This one is 80 kilos and the awning is 26 kilos. So you can make up your own mind if you want to put that on your vehicle, but having put that on my vehicle and taken it through extremely tough terrain all around Australia. It's still kicking, it's still doing its job. So, <sighs> I quite like how you cab, you know? I quite like it. So maybe, maybe I would get it the same thing again today. Thank you so very much for watching. Stay tuned for part two. If you enjoy the content on this channel, consider subscribing and hit the bell to be notified of future videos. If you would like to say thank you, you can buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash forexadventures. You can further support this channel by buying some merchandise at forexadventures.com.au or signing up for a monthly subscription 
at ko-fi.com slash forexadventures. Thank you so much for your support, and I shall see you in the next video.